Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. A warm welcome to you. It's literally a warm welcome, but the room has a little bit of air conditioning. So I'm going to use the cool temperatures as long as they last. A very warm welcome to all of you to the IWM's annual fellows and friends meeting. It is, in a sense, same procedure as every year, but there are a few surprises this year, as you will see in a moment. I would, to begin with, like to thank the take the opportunity to thank all of you who have been with us throughout the year, shown an interest in our events, in our publications, in our newsletter, have been with us at the 35th anniversary celebration in the Hofburg, those of you who have come to our very many events. I think we counted 89 events this year. So uh, we kept many people in Vienna quite busy. I would take, like to take the opportunity especially to thank our donors, some of whom are here tonight with us. And I would especially like to thank the staff of the IWM, without whom all that we've achieved last year would not have been possible. Today, as some of you know, is the 8th of June, it would have been Shishtof Mishailsky's 70th birthday. We decided therefore in honor of his memory to begin today with the first Shishtof Mishailsky Memorial Lecture. It's a great pleasure and a privilege for me that Professor Alexander Smoller has accepted to give the lecture today. It also, unfortunately, coincides with his retirement from the board of the IWM. <laughs> but, I think, but I think he's happy at retiring from the board for the simple reason he's not going to get telephone calls from me in Warsaw and Paris asking for advice at all times of the day and the evening. But nevertheless, uh, I hope that now that you have officially retired, you will come back without having to give me <laughs> advice. Great, glad pleasure. <laughs> um, it's also uh, an occasion on which I would like to announce the fact that the Jan Patochka Memorial Archive at the IWM will be extended by us to include, uh, together with it, uh, the es literary estate of Krzysztof Michalski. This archive will be at the Institute, and I'm very, very happy that his two daughters, Yulia and Kalinka Michalska, are here with us tonight. They accepted our invitation to come over for the first lecture in honor of their father, but also gave us the permission to use his name for the lecture. I think many of you, and probably you are tired of being told today by half the audience, I remember you as a little girl. <laughs> I can promise I cannot say this. <laughs> So I welcome you as young women, but as women who have had a long association with the house. And if it had not been for your father, none of us would be here today. So thank you very, very much for being with us. And among the audience are many friends of your fathers who probably even may not have seen you as young girls. So it's wonderful to give you and them the opportunity to share this evening with us. It's an evening on which we also say farewell. We say farewell to Hannah Fisher, who is actually the person who is responsible for the room in which we are sitting. She's the one who came as the librarian of the IWM, has been with us for several decades, and built up what was initially a very small collection and little apartment to what is now a collection of 40,000 books, which spans the entire house. We ran out of space, so many of the books are in various rooms in the house. She handed over charge of the library to our new librarian, but what she has done for us is a sterling service in the last year, and which is she has been in charge of archiving and digitalizing and cataloging all of Krzysztof Michalski's publications, 
He had started with a bibliography, but as Hannah Fisher discovered, his own bibliography of his writings was deficient in many ways. And therefore, she has been completing it. She has found a lot of unpublished manuscripts, which she has added to it. And she's leaving behind the entire collection, which we will house. And I'm very, very happy that both of you, Yulia and Kalinka, have given us permission to house your father's writings, published and unpublished. So that both the archives, the Michalski archives and the Patoshka archives, will be here uh, at the IWM housing two thinkers and representatives of the second and third generation, if you like, of Central European phenomenologists, because your father considered himself to be a student of Patoshka. So there is a generational and a direct link here. Let me first say a few words to uh, Hannah, and I decided I'm going to do this in German. Uh, I think Hannah's English is equally good. My Polish would have been a disaster. So uh, we are going to uh, come uh, um, stick to German for just a few minutes. We wollen uns nun von einer langjährigen Mitarbeiterin, man könnte sogar sagen, eine Institution des Institutes heute Abend verabschieden. Frau Fischer ist seit nunmehr über 33 Jahren am EWM. Unter ihrer Aufsicht entstand eines seiner Kernstücke, die Bibliothek. Anfang lediglich eine Ansammlung von Büchern, die in einem Raum, einem einzigen Raum, Platz fanden, wurde daraus allmählich eine Sammlung von über 40.000 Werken, die sich über das Haus verteilen, wie ich schon erwähnte. Nachdem sie die Bibliothek nun seit einem Jahr bei Katharina Graz in fähigen Händen weiß, konnte sie sich in den letzten Monaten der Sichtung des Archives des Institutes widmen, leistet zudem einen wertvollen Beitrag für die Erstellung, wie ich schon erwähnte, eine Gesamtbibliografie von Krzysztof Michalskis Werk. Liebe Frau Fischer, im Namen des Institutes will ich mich bei Ihnen herzlich für Ihr jahrelanges Engagement und Ihren unablässigen Einsatz für das Institut und seine Bibliothek heute Abend bedanken. Als Zeichen unserer Wertschätzung dürfen wir Ihnen neben einem kleinen Blumenstrauß zwei weitere kleine Aufmerksamkeiten überreichen. Eine davon nimmt Bezug auf die Vergangenheit, die andere Verweis auf die Dinge, die Sie in Zukunft hoffentlich noch ausführlicher sich widmen können werden. Die Bibliothek, die Sie mit aufgebaut haben, war stets nicht nur Arbeitsort, sondern auch Begegnungsraum. Ein Zitat von Krzysztof Michalski bringt die Bedeutung dessen zum Ausdruck und ich will es auf Deutsch übersetzt Ihnen vorlesen, weil es steht auf unserem Geschenk. Erst in der Begegnung mit einem anderen, mit einem anderen Menschen, bekommt das Leben einen bestimmten Sinn. Hier entscheidet sich, wer ich bin. Hier entscheidet sich der Sinn meines Menschseins. Wir dürfen Ihnen, Frau Fischer, als Erinnerung an Ihre Wirkungsstätte am Institut ein Foto der Bibliothek mit diesem Zitat und der Unterschriften alle Ihre Kolleginnen und Kollegen überreichen. Wir alle wissen auch, aber wie groß Ihre Liebe für Kunst und Musik ist, nicht nur Bücher. Diese Konzertkarten, die ich Ihnen gleich gebe, sollen Ihnen nicht nur Freude bereiten, sondern auch einen positiven Ausblick auf das geben, was Sie an Vergnüglichem jenseits des Institutes erwartet. Wir wünschen Ihnen von Herzen alles, alles Gute für die Zukunft und vielen herzlichen Dank. Doesn't matter. There's general disorder here. I'll find the order. So let me express my deep gratitude to both of you, Julia and Kalina Michalska, for being with us this evening. And I would like to give you the word to say something in memory of your father. I think you will have a lot of memories of the Institute and of him, which are probably also bound to this place. Let me just say very quickly, Julia is the younger daughter of Krzysztof Michalski. 
She is based in London currently. She's editor of the Art newspaper and regularly writes on art and the art market. Kalina is Krzysztof Michalski's elder daughter. She lives in Riverside, California. She's professor of psychology and neuroscience at UC Riverside and is now director of her own research lab, which I thought has a wonderful title. It's called Kind Lab. Kids Interaction and Neurological Development Lab. I'm very, very happy that you're with us tonight, and please come up here and say something. Thank you so much, Shalini. Um, so we won't say too much because it's a very emotional event and we're already losing our uh, composure. Um, but we just wanted to say thank you so much for having us and we're very, very grateful to be here. Um, the Institute was dad's life and it was a very big part of our life growing up to when we were small, as you mentioned. Um, so we have a lot of memories being here, being in the library, being in the kitchen a lot. Um, <laughs> so. Really, thank you very much for, for sharing this day with us. We really appreciate it. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think our father ever had a birthday party as big as this. Um, he didn't like to um, be made a fuss of over. Um, he instead always turned his attention to other people. And he had a huge spirit, uh, which you feel in every single bookshelf and light fixture and painting that he chose for this institute. And you can hear his laugh bellowing. And as we all know, he loved a good party and he would have loved this one. So thanks for having us. Thank you. So in a way, we stay in the family with Alexandra Spoller, who can definitely say he knew you as children. <laughs> uh, let me just do my duty to introduce uh, briefly Alexandra Spoller for those of you who do not know him. For me, as I just said, he has been an extremely important source of support and strength uh, when I took over the Institute three and a half years ago. Alex is uh, uh, chairman of the board of the Stefan Bartoli Foundation, as well as co-founder and member of the European Council on Foreign Relations. He is a sociologist and econom economist by training at the Warsaw University, and then studied international relations at Johns Hopkins. From 1973 to 2007, he was at the CNRS in Paris, and was co-founder and editor of the quarterly journal of political exile, Annex. He was political advisor to Prime Minister Mazowiecki and foreign policy advisor to Prime Minister Suchochka. He has been a frequent commentator on press, radio, and on television on foreign policy and the internal dynamics of Central Europe. Alex left Poland in 1971, and from 1971 to 89, Alec was in exile in Italy, in France, and in Britain. A theme which runs through a lot of his work, or two themes, I think, which run through a lot of his work, have been understanding the differences between Eastern and Western Europe, but also analyzing in extremely fine detail the language of politics in the region. So I'm going to give you a small quotation from an article he wrote in 2008, so 10 years ago, an article on 1968 seen from a different perspective, the Eastern perspective from the Eurozone, and I quote Alexandra Smaller. The West, churned up by 1968, fascinated me, but I also felt lonely and alien. The people I met in Bologna and Paris were often near to me in age, sensitivity, and literary taste, but at the same time, terribly distant. This began at the level of language. For them, the basic category was revolution. The Western prisoners of semantics, Marxists, Leninists, Trotskyists, Maoists, Situationists, 
anarchists and even socialists were describing the world in the same language as Brezhnev and Gomulka. That was enough to block conversation, not to mention agreement. From the Polish perspective, such language was a vector not just of oppression, but also of dreadful boredom. Joseph Tischner, a founding father of the IWM as well, Joseph Tischner used to tell a joke about two Tatra Highlanders having a conversation at the end of the war. The Reds are coming and they'll starve us, says the one. To which the other replies, starve us or not, they're sure going to bore us to death. <laughs> so this gives you a little flavor of Alexandra Smaller in exile, reflecting on the exile and the differences and the sense of humor, which characterizes a lot of my conversations with him. Among the many writings of his, I just want to mention three. One, the book on taboo and innocence, a collection of his essays on political revolution, civil society, questions of memory politics and anti-Semitism, essays which also <coughs> contain ideas on an international community. In the third part of the book are personal reminiscences of Kuron and Yelensky, but also conversations of his with Raymond Aron. The other book that I would like to mention is uh, his book, Entre Kant et Kosovo, so between Kant and Kosovo, a collection of essays in French in Paris, uh, published in Paris in 2003. And in 2000, the collection which he edited with Mark Plattner, who was incidentally also a fellow of ours, Globalization, Power and Democracy, which explores the emerging post-Cold War international system and its implications for the future expansion and consolidation of democracy. And it examines the other side of this relationship, the impact of the international system on the prospects for democracy. So it brings together many very, very well-known essays and um, uh, political analysts, Robert Cooper, Robert Kagan, Samuel Huntington, Jacques Rubning, who spoke here recently, and Adam Daniel Rothfeld, who was also a fellow of ours. So as you can see, it is a large family, but it's a family which is connected in very many ways. Professor Smoller has been connected with the Institute since 1993 when he was, uh, or he's been connected actually with the Institute before 1993, all, I think immediately from its inception, but he became a corresponding fellow. And that's a title which I have quite, not quite found out what corresponding fellows were in those days. We don't have them anymore. So I have to ask later. Uh, since 1993, he was vice chair of our academic advisory board. He was then chair of our board of trustees. And he was present at the summer school in Cortona. He wrote a lot for our journal Transit. He was a fellow twice in 1989, an important year for the Institute and for Europe in 1997. And in 1990, he coordinated the research project on transitions to democracy. And democracy has been the subject of many of his lectures here, uh, including his lectures on uh, the source of sources of hate, on the ambivalence of religion and humanism, his lecture on en European enlargement seen from Poland, and on questions of memory and identity. His friendship with Krzysztof Michalski dates back to 1960s, as I learned, uh, where they, he was introduced, uh, they were introduced to each other by friends in Warsaw. They were both critics of the regime, but they differed in one point. As I understand, Michalski hated the system, sympathized with the opposition, but he decided not to engage himself politically. Professor Smollar sat in prison after the student protests of 1968 and left the country in 1971. They continued to be in touch, they continued their friendship, and they continued their common projects, among them the IWM. In his reminiscences on Krzysztof Michalski, he cited Jean Monnet, and with that I would like to end my introduction, but also my deep felt gratitude to you. He cited Jean Monnet saying, nothing is possible without people, but nothing can last without institutions. Mm. And it is to this get... Is a, this is Jean Monnet. This is Jean Monnet. This is Jean Monnet. 
And it is with that idea, which I think both of you shared, you and Krzysztof Michalski, that contributed to the building of the institution, which stands tall today. And we have a lot to thank you for that. Thank you very much, Jeligny. <laughs> it was a, it was whole lecture on me. Uh, the, you know uh, what is true, uh, besides many many things true. You mentioned that Krzysztof uh, uh, was very dear friend of mine, and um, till the till the very end since 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 sixties. Um, I quoted it already today, but uh, Timothy Gartnash had a very beautiful sentence after after uh, Christoph left us. He said that he was uh, always like a young man uh, uh, looking for the truth. That there was a combination of joyfulness of the. Uh, he was a youngster till the very end. So today, to think that you would have 70 years, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's impossible. But uh, he was uh, extremely joyful. In the, in the same time, from one minute to another, he was totally changing, extremely serious when uh, serious problems were, 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 were discussed. You know, his history, institute history, of course, you can start from when he was born, but because in a way you can say that he was preparing himself. But the uh, real history started in, in Germany. Um, uh, he, he got a, a fellowship and he worked with a great German philosopher, Godamer, hermeneutics. And actually, the, the person who gave him his fellowship is here. It was Annette Laboré, who then ran uh, the foundation Entraide Intellectuelle. And, and it was the source of the first money. Uh, and Christoph could have come to Germany uh, with Annette's, uh, Annette's uh, help. Uh, when I thought about this uh, Godamer, who played afterwards also a certain role, um, I, I read a, a very beautiful uh, anecdote about conversation of his father, who was a great chemistry, and uh, he was a, a rector of the university. Gadamer was studying University of Marburg. And Gadamer, famous Gadamer philosopher, he was uh, studying with young Heidegger, who was already a famous philosopher. Or, Gadamer, the father, when he was already leaving this world, he wanted absolutely to, to talk to Heidegger. And he posed him one question when, uh, when Heidegger came to the hospital. Do you really believe that philosophy is enough to, uh, of a vacation to occupy one's life? This is, <laughs> I'm thinking about, <laughs> uh, about you and I'm reading it. <laughs> Was it enough, about, enough of a vacation to occupy one's life? I, I think that uh, now moving back to Krzysztof, that he certainly he thought that this is absolutely enough. But it was not enough for his life. He had at least two other uh, faces. He was institution builder. And this institute, this is a uh, great proof of it. But this is not the only, the only institute. He built also the filiere of this institute in Boston. Uh, he, 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 he created the great school I was teaching many years ago, like some people here present also in Cortona, uh, international schools, great schools where, where the young uh, people from Eastern Europe, from Western Europe, and from the States. I remember actually beautiful memory how people from the Eastern uh, Europe, how they were changing from year to year. On the, on the beginning, they were very uncertain. They were afraid to talk. They were very passive. Their English was very bad. And how year after year, the situation changed, and it was impossible to make a difference between people from the, from the East. And, uh, and how uh, Krzysztof was proud of those, of, of, of those changes. He, he, he was one of the authors with, uh, he should be always mentioned, the, uh, per uh, Josef Tischner, his uh, dear friend, um, uh, and contact with the Pope, uh, which, who played a very important role also in the creation of this institute, John Paul II, 
um, John Paul II. They created, uh, once again, here are people who participated in, in Castro Gandolfo uh, seminars, which were great seminars in the presence of Pope, who was silent. He was not speaking, he was listening. It was just like in Krakow beforehand. He was, Pope was listening, but his intellectual interests were were uh, great. He also created institution in Poland, the Institut Spraw Publiczny, Institute of Public Affairs, and some others till the, till, till the very end. And there was another side of Krzysztof. Uh, I mean, he never used the word, I'm using it only because he's not here. I mean, he was a Polish great patriot. He would never use the word, he would, he would consider it as a poor, as a vulgar in a way to use such a word, but he was. Uh, just two or three weeks before he died, uh, I talked to him, I knew very well about his situation. I asked Krzysztof, what would you like me to talk about, uh, to write you about? Uh, he didn't speak anymore, really. He was listening, he said, about Poland. Uh, it meant uh, the dynamics, the situation also what is with his friends, but also the people who are not his friends, but who are in a way always observed by him as a important intellectual or political actors of, 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 Polish, of Polish life. So I was telling him. So, um, uh, so when Cellini proposed me to talk uh, today, I thought, what can I talk about? I am not a phenomenologist. I'm actually not a philosopher at all. Uh, and I, I thought that this is quite obvious, that the only thing I can talk about, this is about Poland. So I'll do that. I mean, not only about, not only about Poland, because, of course, uh, Poland is a part and parcel of much bigger problems. And I will talk, of course, about dramatic problems. Uh, uh, um, you, you know, what was the formula of, of, of Tolstoy in Anna Karenina? Tim will remember it very well, especially in English. Oh, I, I found it. I found it in Anna Karenina. All happy families are alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. So, in a way, Poland is unhappy in its own way. And there is particularities uh, in, the, in the Polish situation. You know, I will quote, I will quote you... Uh, uh, two eminent uh, political, uh, U.S. political scientists, uh, 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 both specialists on democracy, democratization, de-democratization, uh, decline of democracy. And uh, you, you know, it, it's, it's uh, both, are, both are very, very, uh, both are very interesting, I think. It's a little bit long, but I think it's worth listening. One, one this is Steve Levitsky, who published two books which are bestsellers, you know, sort of comparative uh, politics. Uh, and a journalist who made an interview uh, asked him, uh, what's happened in, in Poland and Hungary? And his answer, Hungary and Poland are a mystery for political scientists. The two economies are doing fine. The state administration is operating correctly. It is collecting taxes, paying social benefits, ensuring various services and controlling crimes. By any objective criteria, everything was working fine. People did not have reasons to be angry and anger is the food of populists. Uh, so Levitsky, he didn't see the reason for radical polarization, which for him is a major source of decline of the composition of democracy, the, the radical polarization. What is more important, more interesting is the second, uh, second interview at a uh, scholar, a uh, friend of mine actually, and a great specialist on the problem of democratization, de-democratization, etc. This is Adam Przeworski. This is more interesting, not only because he knows a lot about, uh, he started with Latin America, but he started with Poland, he left Poland. He's Polish, so he knows Poland much better than, than other American political scientists. Uh, and uh, the same answer when, when it was posed, Przeworski answer. I mean, this is, 
the humble sty sight of disaster is shattering. To say the truth, I never heard the scholars to be so frankly. I do not understand why. Theoretically, it shouldn't have happened. Since 1918, 88 countries went through at least two cycles of democratic changes. This is the measure for political scientists, whether it's political, whether the system is, the democratic system is already stable, two cycles. And got the status of consolidated democracy. Poland had such a status in 2015. Such democracy usually lasts long. Out of 88 consolidated democracy, only 14 failed. Przeworski's word. The reason for such failure of democracy may be poverty. Democracy that failed had, on average, less than $6,000 per capita. Poland, with its average income per capita over $12,000, should have resisted. Or let's take economic growth. Failed democracy had 1% growth of the GNP and something much less. Poland, with its high growth, much over 3%, should not have had to worry. Income inequalities measured by Gini coefficient were not dangerous high. Uh, the same about the professional activity of the population. It was 50% in failed democracy, 60% in lasted democracy, and more than 60 in Poland. And I'm finishing already. Other factors they may threaten democracy are such as incapacity to form the government, strikes, much street manifestation, protests, nothing like that took place in Poland. The total mystery. What's happened? This is this is interesting question, and I, I, I know that more interesting question concerns the future, but I know nothing about the future, and I will not formulate that there is a, a lot of hypotheses. More interesting maybe is to talk about today's situation, but this is much more journalistic, and afterwards, and afterwards there is a lot of people who are really interested can read a, a lot about it. So I think the mystery of the past is really. Is, 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 is really a mystery. Uh, where, where, what I've done. Yeah. Uh, before I, I, I turn to answer to, to the question, I'll try to <laughs> very cautiously to answer what happened in Poland. Um, I, I will pose another question, which was totally forgotten, but which is very important to understand today's situation as well. The question was posed in 89 or early than 89. Uh, and the opinion formulated by many scholars, Western scholars then, were quite surprising. That it, that it, it was the question about the prospects of democratic transformation in, in East Central Europe, especially uh, in Poland. And you, you know, uh, I, will, I will talk about many, or I will think about many people who are present here. This is, for example, Klaus Ofe, who is a great sociologist, for example, but also people, philosopher Jon Elster, uh, or Adam Przeworski once again. Uh, they were saying that double transformation, economic and political and social political, is impossible. Impossible just. Even one formulated impossibility theorema, one of them I will not mention his name, impossibility theorema about something which happened. And why? The argument is very strong, and I think it's still today it's very strong. Just because if you introduce democratic changes, it means that you empower the people who represent majority, especially those big or Economic transformation means that those majorities are paying very high price. So the, what they will do, they will resist changes. And for example, once again, my friend Przeworski, who did, do not understand what's happened now, then with a lot of eloquence was saying that what is uh, those countries are risking, this is sort of Latin American 
uh, vicious circle that there will be uh, phases of, of, uh, of democratic revolution and then uh, populist dictat dictatorship. Just because you cannot have both democratic revolution and economic capitalist type of transformation. This type of critique was rather of left, left liberal critique. But the people who are rather uh, liberal conservative also uh, were convinced that it was totally impossible and one of, let's say, char of political scientists for half a century, certainly great men of political century, some, some hunting, Samuel Huntington, he wrote in the middle of the 80s an article about the future of democracy where there's only one paragraph about communist countries and the conclusion very clear, no hope, no any prospect for democracy in those countries. Why? Because there is no democracy without private property and you cannot change the well, well, of, of history. You cannot reintroduce the private property where private property was eliminated. So no prospect of democracy. In long article it was one small acapit. Another scholar who was very much connected to the institute, there's a lot of people in this domain. This is one of the reasons I have chosen the subject. I mean this this uh, center is one of the centers of, of reflection with the people like uh, Ivan Krasiv in Vovan Voivoda, like Timothy Garten Ash and, and, and many Sandel who was only here with a lecture about this subject. This is one of the center of the reflection on it. Or, the, or beside Huntington, Peter Berger, who was very close to the Institute. You know, Peter Berger, he published a book where he wrote that this is totally impossible to to reintroduce. Why? This is an interesting argument. Because private property has no its own principle of legitimacy. Legitimacy of private property, not small private property, but big private property, can come only by sheer uh, existence. Just the fact that it exists, people are considered it as a natural. The moment you put into question, there is no hope. <laughs> no hope of, re of reestablishing it. So, you know, two, two persons rather of uh, liberal conservatives were, were convinced uh, about the same, those people of, of, uh, of uh, rather uh, left li liberal conviction. Actually, to say the truth, I was mentioning it already in presence of, of Tim, we participated now in the, uh, in the conference of alumni of Woodrow Wilson Center where we spent a year. Uh, and it was just before great changes, but you felt already those changes. And I was very cautiously, but I formulated quite pessimistic prediction about possibility of changes of the regime in Poland. For, once again, different arguments than those I, I mentioned already. My arguments were sociological to a big extent, sociological, political. First, first I... Uh, uh, the same as this last li left liberal artism, but also social changes with, with upper class eliminated or emigrated, with the uh, middle class uh, Jews killed, Germans expelled or they left uh, themselves. Even the working class was decimated. There was only conservative peasantry and very conservative Polish church. So how can you really um, uh, uh, assure the transformation, modernization in Poland with, with, uh, with such a forces. So I, I, I used other arguments as well. I'm just showing you. I think that all those arguments I mentioned are good, are correct. But the only problem is that they, that they reflect partial understanding of the reality. That there, is no, that there was no an understanding that those countries wanted as quickly as possible to abandon Soviet bloc. Where? To, to the West. So West was the role model. So the Western model, Western solution, political, legal, economic, was a natural uh, role model. Afterwards, in the case of Poland, Poland was in a horrible state. There was hyperinflation towards the end of the, of, uh, um, uh, uh, of uh, 89. There was no alternative to the point that even socialism, democratic socialism, was not considered as an alternative. Nobody seen an alternative. It was like in famous Mrs. Thatcher 
sentence, no alternative, you know. It was, and it was perceived by everybody. We, it was sort of revolution imposed from the top. Uh, from the top, but which was accepted. It was the project which was elaborated by elites and which was, which was, which was accepted. Uh, so, in a way, it explains, there are many other arguments why it was possible. Of course, relatively quickly, there was a, important social groups which took advantage from, from changes, which was of, also, of course, very important. M many other arguments, I will not mention them. Let, let's speak about reality, about today's. So, I try to show uh, uh, the, you know, uh, on the margin, the limitation of our knowledge, even <laughs> in the case of the best uh, of the best people, um, and uh, and there is a French saying I love: "Le pire n'est jamais inévitable." The, 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 the worst is never inevitable. So uh, actually, this is my position about Poland and about other countries. And, Today as well, and some of my friends consider that I'm extremely optimistic just by saying such a sentence, you know. Uh, uh, so, uh, so, what happened in the country like Poland with all those positive results I mentioned just quoting uh, Adam Przeworski, really positive, with the opinion when the political changes took place in 2015, more than 80% of Poles were happy with their life. More than 80% were happy with the European Union, more than in any other country. Actually, Hungary is the second country <laughs> optimistic about the European Union. This is, this is, uh, this is interesting. Uh, this is an inter interesting case. So, uh, uh, so, uh, so what, what happened? Now, unfortunately, I have too many papers, and, and I, I should, however, uh, uh, look, look for them. Uh, this I will put here. Uh, yeah. Uh, the one explanation, this is banalization sort of hypothesis, that, you know, it was just normal, actually, by very brilliant political scientist who wrote a brilliant book on populism, uh, Jan Werner Müller used uh, uh, in politics with another very well known now political scientist, yeah, Yasha, Yasha Munk. He said that, that in the West, uh, uh, people with a certain ease, they are talking about Eastern Europe, well, that they are back to their backwardness, that they are not prepared. No, they behaved rational way, like in the West. Because we shouldn't forget, which is true, that d before election, both parties, Orban party in Hungary and Kaczynski's parties in Poland, they presented very different program from what they are apply uh, were applying afterwards. I mean, uh, much more peaceful, not revolutionary, not contrevolutionary, not illiberal democracy. No, in the case of Poland, of Kaczynski, mostly what he proposed, uh, actually quite interesting, uh, it's some elements of leftist program of, of redistribution. Unfortunately, liberals during eight years beforehand, they haven't done too much about it. So it was, it was the, uh, the, the factor which played an important, very important role. The second factor, very important role, which is uh, true about not only about Poland, not only about, about region. This is the, uh, the community is coming back. That after uh, Thatcher's and Reagan's individualism, ex excessive individualism with the, with the crisis, you know, people do not believe anymore that uh, in individual way of survival. They believe in the community and there is a patriotism is, is back, for example. Uh, this is uh, quite eccentric, what you can see in Poland, man manifestation of this collective, uh, collective uh, identity, I I identification. But this is an important factor. And in, in, the, in the Polish case, of course, also Catholicism. Those two factors of, of belongingness create an extremely important role in the success of, of, of Kaczynski. 
the left and the center, they didn't dispose any message, uh, you, you know, assuring sort of collective identity and collective dignity in the people who, who were afraid. Although Poland was in very good economic situation, but war was on the Ukrainian side, migration was, was coming, in the West was crisis, so the fear was present even if it, you can say objectively it was not justified. The fear was there, the fear is still is, is still there. So this banalization of, of, of Mueller, that it was just normal behavior and the fact that afterward they cheated after election, they applied policy which was not democratic. I mean, um, uh, Orban used the formula which was introduced into political science by Farid Zakaria, illiberal democracy. In, in the Polish case, Kaczynski was using the formula impossibilism, you can understand the word, although this is Polish word, that you cannot govern in the situation in the country where it's impossible to do whatever you want to do. This is why he's destroying now justice system. Actually, he's destroying also the parliament parliamentarism, you know. Only once a month there is a meeting, only one minute parliamentarian can speak. He's destroying. Actually, he's destroying even executive because the real executive power is in his hands and he's formally nobody. He's just simple parliamentarian of the ruling party. So this is a mess. This is the... Uh, disinstitutionalization, you, you know, which is, uh, I remember what shocked me very much when I was still student in Poland, I read first book of Huntington and the f one of the first sentence was that the worse, uh, worse than dictatorship is a chaos. Or, or now I think it's true that the danger, bigger danger in Poland, that is chaos, not dictatorship, although dictatorship is unfortunately one of one of, one of possible hypotheses, you know. Uh, so, so this, uh, I, I, I would propose three other hypotheses. I, I, I have many others, but I will not uh, fed you up with all those hypotheses. The first, the first uh, I deduced from um, uh, for uh, brilliant philosopher, uh, leftist, American philosopher Michael Walzer. He published uh, two years ago a book, Paradox of Liberation. And the question he posed, there are three case studies he's analyzing, India, Algeria, and Israel. And the question he posed, how is it possible that in those three countries where uh, the countries were liberated by um, rather leftist f forces, uh, modernist, uh, uh, secular, pro-Western, who are trying to introduce Western models of modernization. 25 years later, we, 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 have, a, 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 we have a regime, fundamentalist religious regime, in two, those three countries. I don't want to compare Poland to those three countries, but this is exactly 25 years later that we had radical changes. We, of course, we have no fundamentalism, but we have very radical, let's say let's say the true reactionary church be very big part of the church not all uh, so so how how it's happened what is the mechanism i mean the question which are interesting for michael walzer are not interesting to us especially because he is posing the question as a leftist uh, uh, thinker so what mistakes were committed by the left he's talking about arrogance towards believers and so on. I mean, uh, maybe he's right, maybe he's not right. Certainly this is not the case in, in Poland. What is the case in Poland? This is the fear. Fear of modernization, fear of, of westernization, uh, which is very profound in the, in the church. Uh, when John Paul II was, was alive, he was very much in favor of inter European integration. But he believed that in a way from Poland will start the re Christianization of Europe. And you have a lot of people now, much more in Polish church and among uh, conservative intellectuals who are writing every day almost. People very close to, the, to those who govern Poland that the, the, the real Europe, this is not the Europe we can see today. 
This is the euro for multiculti, multi ethnic, you, you know, of, of uh, demoralization, uh, of uh, um, uh, same sex uh, uh, marriages, and so on. The real Europe, this is the real of their dreaming about, which probably never existed, but this is the Christian Europe of small churches, of small communities, small villages. This is not conservative, this is reactionary thought and reactionary dreams. This is the reaction, the fear, the fear of modernization. This is the, this is the refusal of modernization. Actually, uh, Orban is using the same language. The difference is that Hungary is much more religious country. First, this is two religious. This is Protestants and Catholic divided, and much less religious than Poland is. In the, po in the Polish case, this language is not a joke. This is not in the case of. Orban, you can believe or not believe, but in the case of Poland, this is important factor. This is imp important po social, social and 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 uh, and poli political uh, uh, factor. So uh, the, the 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 other hypothesis. So th this is uh, the, the, so this is uh, one hypothesis that that we have. This this is not even economic reaction. This is cultural reaction. This is idea on, on the level of idea. This is reaction of the, of the people who are afraid, who do not believe in the West anymore because the West compromised itself with the crisis, with the mass migration, and so on. In all regions, you, you can see the change in attitudes towards. To, towards, the, towards the West. So those ideas which are anti-Western, profoundly anti-Western ideas, you will find openly today uh, voiced uh, in, the, in the press, in journals, in political, in political the, the, the leader. Uh, Kaczynski, he was saying, Poland will Christianize Europe. You know, this is a quite courageous statement, you know. Um, you know, but, but now the, the, the second argument I, I will say, I, will, I, I, can, I can call it Tocquevillian argument, or in Tocqueville's analysis of the, the old regime and revolution, uh, one of the arguments he used, why revolution took place, it was the consequence of the policy of, uh, uh, of the absolute major, uh, 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 absolute what do you call it? Absolute monarchy. Pardon? Absolute monarchy. Yeah, yeah this is uh, uh, absolute monarchy to force all aristocracy to live in the core, uh, king's core. It was a self-assurance to control them better. But the consequence was that they lost any social utility they had before. Depending their dependence, or giving justice, or some other functions. Though they become, in the eyes of the most French, that's just the parasites. Or my feeling is that today's political class, in the West especially, is perceived to a big extent as a parasite. Because, especially after the war, with the introduction uh, of the welfare state, their expectations, which are linked very much to to the state, and the modern state is not capable anymore, or at least during a crisis period, but just not able anymore to fulfill those obligation or those expectation of of the citizens. This is this is why you can read such an extravagant sentence as Minister of Michael Grove: "The people in this country have had enough of experts." He himself finished. Uh, Oxford. He himself was an expert, but this is the reflection of, of of the attitudes towards the quite often just educated people, in big the, the, the sort of revolts of the masses against 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 elites. This is the feeling that the elites, which are supposed to solve social problems that are not capable to solve, or maybe they do not want to solve. At the same time, they are manifesting quite often, quite often the arrogance. And, um, uh, and the, the, the third hypothesis I will attribute to, uh, to my French master. This is why I found myself finally, after immigration in France, it was great, a great scholar, philosopher, political scientist, Raymond Aron. 
I posed him once a question, how can you explain that uh, after the uh, great successes of France, uh, of so-called Count Glorieuse, 30 great years of development of France, there's so many of uh, unhappiness in, in France. Uh, um, uh, and he answered me, I, I, I noted more or less, France achieved in 25 years more than in previous 100 or 150 years. Price was very high. They are victims. There was a lot of suffering. But when the goal was achieved, the reaction was, that's all? And the people uh, turned themselves against power. This is exactly the situation that this is exactly the situation in Poland and in many other countries, especially in Poland. Especially, this is probably uh, uh, the element of cultures not only in Poland and also in the West that we are uh, we are living in synchronic, not diachronic cultures. We are not thinking about the past, not thinking about the future. And Poles, when they are judging their situation, they are comparing immediately with the Berlin, with London, with Paris, with Vienna. They were never thinking about the undevelopment of Poland, of the fate of their parents. So after all those sufferings, and they are recognizing that it was a success story. They're happy, but they will never forget to the people who applied those sufferings to them during the transition period. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Alec, for this um, analysis of the current uh, situation, but particularly of the past of Poland. I think this may open a Pandora's box of questions here. So I'm going to defer the questions to one floor below. I'm going to invite everyone to eat and drink with us, and of course continue the discussion with Alec. I think we may all be a little more comfortable than sitting on these chairs in a rather warm room. So I'm going to thank you very much once again for the talk. And invite you to share some food and drink with us. Please come downstairs to the cafeteria, which most of you know well. If you don't, just follow the rest yes, of us. All others who know. <laughs>